we hit the big time every every time i i get somebody on here that it's like wow this is things that i read about and then i actually get to interview someone who's working on those things that i'm reading about and i'm like wow that's really cool tech this just for me is is like a dream come true so i'm super stoked to have you on here ravi and it's nice to have everyone else joining us as always i'm sure you all know but if you don't know we have our Slack community that I will try to convince Ravi to get into by the end of this talk. <laughs> and if you are interested in joining it, the link is in the chat. I'm throwing it in right now so that you can all see. So uh, we've got the Slack community. We have got lots of bright minds in there. Lots of really cool conversations going on around MLOps. And we're starting a lot of very cool initiatives. And the coolest thing about this, in my opinion, is that the community is, is of no one, right? And so anyone can come and say, hey, I want to start this initiative. Like uh, we have a really cool initiative around um, data privacy coming up. And there is a great podcast that was spearheaded by some of the community members. And so we've got this incredible podcast that is going to be put out because some community members said, hey, this is actually something that people that are working on MLOps should probably fam be familiar with, um, especially when it comes to PII and that kind of interesting stuff. So that is my plug for the community. Get in it if you are not. The link is in the chat. And without further ado, I think we can go ahead and begin with Ravi Kiran. Welcome, Ravi. It is so good to have you here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Demetrius, for the kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, yeah, yeah. And before, maybe before you do that, I wanted to just let everyone know, because I mentioned right now that I, um, I have been reading about Metaflow. We're here, for those who don't know who Ravi is, He's a software engineer with the machine learning infrastructure team at Netflix. And as many of you know, Netflix has open sourced their machine learning infrastructure um, tool, we could say, Metaflow. And that is really what we wanted to dive into today. And I had heard about Metaflow last year at reInvent. I think you guys released last year. You released it as open source last year at reInvent, right? Yeah. And so I just like the thing that stuck in my mind more than anything, and I'm sharing my screen before you get to share your screen. I, I jumped in front of you. This is an incredible drawing. You can see what I, this like diagram right here, just stuck in my mind it, forever. It will be etched in my mind. Um, hopefully you can see that. Tell me Ravi, if you can't. Yeah, yeah, no, you stole my th thunder that's in my presentation, but yes, it, it is a diagram that I think has resonated with a lot of people, so yes. It is, yeah, and if anybody wants to see this, I'll also post this um, this in the chat, uh, and I'll, I'll stop sharing now so that you can, you can have all of the glory for you, Ravi, <laughs> but that diagram is just, it's incredible, man, that is like, exactly it hits the nail on the head so props and kudos to whoever the um the designer was the graphic designer was that created that because it puts it so easily to understand now go ahead feel free to share your screen and and let's get underway with this we've got a lot of questions to ask if anyone has questions they want to ask ravi feel free to throw them in the chat or there's the q a section um, also and then yeah I look forward to, I've got a bunch of questions that I've sourced from your team that you probably heard about because your team probably was asking you, what's going on with this guy asking me questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just quickly want to confirm if you can see my slides. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess we can go ahead into the presentation. Um, here today, I, I thought <clears throat> I'll create this sort of small uh, lightning talk of sort for those of you unfamiliar with Metaflow. It's nice to see that some of you already are. And hopefully I can take, uh, oops, I can take, uh, I don't know what's happening. Do you see a black screen? Yeah, it went black. Uh, okay, is it better now? Yep. Yes. Now it's back. 
Right, so I prepared sort of a, a high level overview of Metaflow and then hopefully in Q&A we can take some more uh, specific questions either related to model ops or anything else about Metaflow. So yeah, uh, without further ado, Hello everyone, I'm Ravi Kran Chiravari from the machine learning infrastructure team here at Netflix to talk about supercharging our data scientist productivity using a framework we built called Metaflow. I thought I'd preface this presentation with the why. Why did we have to build Metaflow? Prior to building Metaflow, we spent a few months working alongside Netflix data scientists to observe and learn the general workings of a typical machine learning pipeline. Through this process, we wanted to identify the pieces that were either non-trivial or unenthusiastic to a data scientist so that we as infrastructure could abstract that out for them. We also wanted to learn about the software engineering challenges faced along the way so that we could build solutions that would make life simpler for them. More on this later. I thought I would first present sort of an infographic of a very simplified view of how a machine learning workflow pro design process might look like, and then um, sort of hopefully expand out from there. So with that, uh, it always begins with an idea. You might be having lunch with a colleague or watching your favorite Netflix show and suddenly have this flashy new machine learning idea to solve a problem X. Oftentimes, a machine learning pipeline is composed of several steps involving data access, data manipulation, training, and maybe even sometimes batch scoring. So here on this, on this slide, we have this uh, person with an idea and they're just whiteboarding it. An idea is typically meaningless without execution. Our data scientist is now hard at work prototyping their idea on, on a laptop, perhaps in a Jupyter notebook. Machine learning pipelines are also often resource intensive. So, I mean, given a choice, our data scientists would also love to take advantage of probably not just the parallelism on their laptop, but even better, uh, farm out their compute to an instance on the cloud. The idea is promising. And now it's time to run it on a consistent schedule or have it triggered maybe when the input data is updated. I'm thinking of scheduling. So for simpler projects, you might be okay to just use a tool like cron on your computer. But if you want to productionize your pipeline, you're probably interested in integrating with your favorite production grade scheduler. So this is also some more work to do integrating with some other pieces of infrastructure. Life is great. You have everything working smoothly for a few days in the cloud. Is this it? Yeah. Oh no, <laughs> life happens and things are crashing and burning. It would be really nice if you're easily able to reproduce the failure, quickly iterate on your laptop or wherever else, um, get a fix and push it out. I am probably oversimplifying some of the challenges faced along the way and probably the, the whole life cycle is probably more complex than this, uh, but I wanted to have some sort of a, a foundation, a simplistic workflow, um, and then talk about how Metaflow fits into this. So this creates a natural segue to our next section, what is Metaflow? Metaflow is a human-centric framework for building and managing real-life data science projects. It's been battle-tested at Netflix for over three years now and used for an array of machine learning use cases that are related to catalog, content production, and probably some other data science needs as well uh, outside of machine learning. Demetrius mentioned this uh, very popular stack of ours. So, um, so here it is. Um, an alternate realization from the comic strip is that production grade data science projects rely on a thick stack of infrastructure. A typical data science project at Netflix 
actually touches all the layers of this stack, if you ask me. Data is accessed from a data warehouse, which is at the bottom. Uh, this could be a folder of files, a database, or a multi-petabyte data lake. The modeling code that crunches this data is executed in a compute environment, which can, again, as, as we spoke in the infographic, range from a laptop to a large-scale container management system. Then comes a job scheduler, which is often used to orchestrate multiple units of work. Beyond this, there are also some other challenges to think about software engineering wise. How do you architect the code to be executed? Do you want to structure it as a object hierarchy, Python modules, or packages? How do you version the code, input data, and the models produced? Ideally, the data scientist wouldn't want to spend too much energy thinking about the software architecture um, of their project. After the model has been deployed to productions, model operations become a pertinent question. How do you keep the code running reliably in production? How do you monitor its performance? How do you deploy new versions of the code to run in parallel with the previous version? The software industry has spent over a decade perfecting DevOps best practices from normal, for normal software. We here are just getting started with data science. And lastly, at the very top of the stack, there's the question of how do you produce features for your models or how do you develop the models in the first place? Maybe you want to use off the shelf libraries to begin with. Honestly, this is the area where the skills of a data scientist become, start to get like most useful. And, and I mean, we saw this before, but um, there, is, <laughs> there is this relationship. Like if you went around asking a data scientist uh, how much they'd care about this whole stack, there is this sort of inverted triangle. Data scientists, given a choice, would want to stay as top in this, um, in this stack as possible. And, they really don't have that much of a strong opinion for lower levels of this stack. And it sort of creates this nice and contrasting and symbiotic relationship for us as infrastructure, um, specifically machine learning infrastructure, to, to, to notice that the amount of infrastructure needed is much higher at the lower levels of this stack. And also that's where we can have the most opinion, uh, probably make a lot of choices, design decisions on behalf of our data scientists, produce something simple, beautiful, and then, and then provide them as much freedom and um, at, at the higher levels of this stack. So that's what Metaflow does. Metaflow beautifully packages all of its offerings into this one simple library that is actually now available open source uh, for both Python and R. Uh, R is something new, so definitely for those of you who use R, like check us out. Uh, we have easy integrations with the AWS cloud, giving you immense amount of freedom at the higher levels of the stack while being opinionated about the lower la layers of this infrastructure stack. And, and I'll get into this more, like what, what our opinions look like. So, how can you go about using Metaflow for your data, scientist, data science needs? Also, while at it, I thought it would be useful to quickly touch upon our philosophy on some of our opinionated design decisions, since some of you probably have infrastructures that you've built on your own. So hopefully, uh, beyond just describing what we have, uh, I think it's often helpful to like describe the why and and why we have what we have so that that might um, hopefully be something that you can take back uh, from this presentation. So first and foremost, our, our thinking is that people love DAGs, uh, directed acyclic graphs. I don't know if they love them, but definitely it's probably easy to think of your machine learning pipeline as a DAG. Our philosophy is to keep it simple and to allow the user to express their workflow closest to how it's in their head. And we want to keep the syntax as intuitive as possible. 
It is true that we do impose some requirements on your DAG structure. Um, that's why even there is this acyclic um, restriction, for example, so that we can do as much static validation as possible. It would be really nice if, you know, or, or we believe it would be nice if, if we can throw an error quickly if something is amiss rather than wait for a while uh, before you deploy it into some cloud machine, et cetera, and then throw a runtime error. So that's where some of this static validation comes into play. And this is really helpful when a lot of data scientist needs actually are in prototyping. So there's definitely this quick iteration, wanting to develop in a fast turnaround cycle. And a lot of this time that you can save and you know, even it's a simple configuration parameter that's just misspecified. It's nice to quickly throw an error rather than do all your initializations, do all your network calls and then throw an error. Oh, oops, this value is wrong. So that's why this is. This is our simple view, or perhaps my simple view of the machine learning world. There is some data that enters your pipeline as input. You have a giant compute, ultimately resulting in a model as an output. Let's unravel this a bit further. Here's a first glimpse of a sample workflow expressed with Metaflow constructs. Each step here is annotated with an at step decorator and you can express the transition from each node to its next using the self.next function. We do support static branching as depicted here on this slide for branches A and B. And for any of you trying to like read the slide, um, quickly touching on it, every workflow is meant to have a start step and an end step. And then we have the start step sort of branching out to branches A and B. And also typically whenever you do have a branch, we do require you to specify a, a join step. Um, and as you can note here, A and B go to a join step and the join step is slightly different because it tries to provide you access to all of its inputs. And this will get more clearer as I go through the presentation, but this is just a, <clears throat> a first look into Metaflow and, and what we think a workflow looks like. When it comes to syntax, we do believe it's easiest for our users <clears throat> to express intent through idiomatic Python instead of learning a new domain specific language or DSL. You just notice sort of the idiomatic Python nature of, of how even our steps are specified with decorators, for example. But wherever possible, we also wanna strike the necessary balance between providing sensible defaults but at the same time, leaving some room for user intent, <clears throat> excuse me. For example, specifying parallelization or resource requirements like GPUs does sometimes is better so coming from the user, like imagine you have a training step and you know that it's gonna be GPU intensive. Instead of us trying to do sort of a lot of smart checks around it, it's nice if they just can specify that. But more importantly, I also think it makes it quite readable when someone else wants to reason about a given workflow. At least at Netflix, like we want to think about somebody else might inherit your workflow. And at that time, sort of having your configuration split elsewhere uh, versus just inline into your workflow, um, I think could make it quite easy so that you don't have to like look at a bunch of places before you can exactly reason about what this step is going to do uh, or task when it executes elsewhere. So touching upon our compute layer, we thought it will be really easy for our users, since they anyway begin with a laptop or prototyping on a laptop, how would it be if we just gave them bigger laptops on demand? I do think it's easier to think about sort of single box, uh, you know, compute um, instead of distributed. And Metaflow has always been cloud first. So making it quite easy to just run a subset of your steps with dif different resource requirements seamlessly on the AWS cloud using AWS Batch. Honestly, this is one of my favorite features um, of Metaflow, which makes it quite easy 
for users to transition from a all local prototyping experience to production. And this is somewhere in between because you're just sort of trying to run a subset. Uh, and for instance, in this example, we have step A, which could probably be a CPU intensive step. You're probably doing a lot of compute, for example, in it. And at that time, you may want to specify, let's say, you want a box with multiple cores. And you can do that by saying at resources CPU equals 16. Whereas you have this other step where probably you're doing something like data manipulation or data access. And for those of you familiar with a lot of these data science libraries, specifically, let's say Pandas, it's quite memory intensive. And we almost every single day have some or the other user like wanting you know, much larger RAM just so that they can load this data frame into memory. And that's where this, this whole idea stems from. And Metaflow like just makes it easy for you to run some steps locally, just because you can on your laptop while running some on the cloud, paying for just the time that you use it, making it quite a nice in between uh, from running it all the way in production before you like get there. We also understand that sometimes uh, you might want more than a single box for your machine learning workloads. Specifying a hyperparameter grid, for example, where you want to horizontally farm off compute to multiple sub-processes on your laptop or multiple containers on AWS cloud is again quite easy with our for each construct, which executes n copies of the same step as different tasks while feeding each one of them a distinct input. So stepping into this a bit further, you have in this example, this variable self.grid, which has multiple values. Uh, this is meant to simulate how a hyperparameter grid for you might look like. So you have values x, y, and z. For the for each construct, you want to specify the variable name uh, that you want to for each over. And what this does um, for Metaflow is that we understand that the step A needs to have copies uh, for the cardinality as the size of the grid. And Metaflow takes care of feeding each of those tasks, which are distinct invocations of the step, a different distinct input, so like X, Y, and Z. And then similar to static branching, you are required to provide a join step for even the for each fan out. And you as the user get a choice to, to access all of the inputs and decide what you want to do with respect to data propagation thereafter. And then you have the end step. And I will get into data propagation a little bit more. So um, hopefully again, this will get clearer. In our comic strip, we, we saw how useful it would be if failures are a feature and not, and not an afterthought. We persist all the state and data onto our storage layer backed by AWS S3 to enable seamless reproduction of your failures on your laptop from production environments. We also provide an easy to use but opinionated solution to manage your dependencies so that we can version everything about your machine learning pipeline as much as possible. Lastly, we prefer that our users are able to observe and access everything about their runs using their client so that they can potentially build interesting integrations or dashboards using Jupyter Notebooks or whatever else. So talking about state transfer and persistence, which I just mentioned a couple of slides ago, um, Here's what we mean. Within a given step, anything that you store under self, like self.x here on this slide, is actually versioned and stored in our data store. To keep our storage footprint low, we do two interesting things. One, we efficiently compress the data. And two, we store it in a content addressed fashion to avoid storing duplicate copies across multiple tasks in case the value didn't change. So jumping into this example, here, 
step A has access to this variable X, which stores the value two, and imagine it's written in some place. Now, when step A comes around, it wants to increment the value of X to four, and it also stores that in some space uh, for itself. And similarly for step B, even though A and B, since they're running as branches, like they run in parallel, step B ends up storing its copy of X equals five somewhere else. And in our joint step, this is why the syntax of the joint step is different. It does provide you access to all its inputs. So it provides you access to both A and B and thereby the values, the different values of X, which is A dot X equals four, B dot X equals five. And then you as the user can decide what you want to do with the multiple values. Like either you may want to keep sort of the maximum if it was probably something like accuracy, you want to decide which branch is doing better, or you could probably come up with some composite function of all these inputs, or maybe you just want to store all the inputs. Like all of them are viable options. But our uh, perspective here is to, is to do all of this without asking the user for any choice, like without asking them to decide, oh, do you want to store this, this value X? Do you want to store the loss? Etc. We just want to store everything. And I mean, unless you mentioned it as a local variable, so there is a little bit of user choice, but I think this is something that has become commonplace enough that our users don't have to think about storage footprint and storage overhead. And we can do sort of all these infrastructure optimizations about it uh, should the need arise. One thing I do want to also mention slash dispel uh, is that the content address trick uh, plus S3, it's actually not a ton of storage cost. And it's not just for Netflix, I think for anybody out there um, to do this. So it is not something um, that is not viable if at all it was a smaller company, et cetera. So definitely uh, do try it out and, and let us know if at all you don't, you think the cost is too high, but um, hopefully we think that's not the case. Jumping into dependencies, um, I know I mentioned like long ago in the first slide that there were some things um, from a software engineering point of view that as we like work with data scientists, we also wanted to build solutions that made life simpler for them uh, that were either hard problems or things that, you know, just bit them along the way. And, and honestly, this is one of them. I think you could have an entire presentation and we have in the past made presentations just focused on dependency management. But for completeness, I thought I'll just spend a slide on it and mention that our dependency management solution is made possible leveraging Anaconda's offering to provide users with isolated version reproducible environments. You can imagine this allows users to experiment with various Conda packages for example, to decide if something might break their workflow, if say a library like TensorFlow 2.0 introduced backward incompatible API changes and the user is, is, is wondering if at all upgrading to TensorFlow 2.0 might, might cause some surprises. So for such a use case as this flow represents, you could have your step A running at Conda and specifying just the libraries you might need like TensorFlow 1.14. And potentially you could duplicate that step and run an alternate step B and upgrade it almost by just saying Conda TensorFlow 2.0 and then running this. And Metaflow takes care of all the mapping of just that simple one line Conda spec to, actual, to actually a Conda environment packaging that in case you're running your flow elsewhere on a remote machine, um, hopefully taking care of <clears throat> performance issues. And also this, this does have, uh, this sort of freezes all your transitive dependencies as well. And that's why we went with this solution. Um, so the, the overall goal and philosophy here is simple, like dependency management is hard and we want to get as close to reproducibility of your workflows as possible. And most importantly, no surprises. Like once a user uh, deploys a flow to production, we want it to just run hopefully forever without any problems. 
and and a lot of these things that we do about it like whether it's state persistence and storage uh, try to version everything conda all of it is around the same um, larger umbrella which is to get you a reproducible machine learning pipeline as much as possible and one small note is um, I do mention reproducibility as much as possible because uh, although not evident in this slide, like our input data usually comes from a data lake. So we do have certain best practices on how you can version that data, have this immutable copy in S3, but we are not necessarily versioning that or storing that as well. I mean, you could store that as an input artifact, but if you have, I don't know, like, uh, terabytes of data, it might not be as feasible to also version that along with your machine learning pipeline. Uh, but we can talk about this in Q&A further. I don't know if I just confused people for more or, or hopefully people got the idea. No, this is but, great about dependencies. I think this is such a good point. And I know that a lot of people have talked about this, especially when they use many tools together, how to manage dependencies. Yeah, uh, I know this is a model ops meetup and I've tried to mostly give a, a larger overview of Metaflow, uh, but we definitely have things we can uh, talk about model ops. Uh, in this presentation, I just have sort of a simple slide about it, but definitely open to chatting more about it in Q&A. Uh, everything in Metaflow is version. I cannot emphasize this more. Uh, so you can leverage our Python client to access any of the flows or runs that you've executed with Metaflow. As this slide shows you, uh, we do have a concept of namespaces. And um, here you can see a given user might specify their namespace so that when they try to access a flow's sort of latest run, you only get the latest run within your namespace. And now a different user could do the same. And even though it's the same flow, they get different results because we're mostly respecting the namespace that they have. The idea behind these namespaces is so that you as a user could take a given flow and run it. And the idea is hopefully we set enough guardrails such that a harmless execution of a flow doesn't end up overriding somebody else's results. So that if I take like, Dimitrios takes the flow, runs it, it sort of goes under his namespace. And if I do it, it sort of also goes into my namespace. Um, and however, Netflix also has this culture of, of freedom and responsibility, definitely a very transparent culture. And that's why these namespaces are in no way meant to be sort of silos that you cannot look at each other's work or you cannot collaborate or such or some such. And that's why you also have access to the global namespace. And you could just go and get sort of information about somebody else's flow and run. We do definitely get asked questions around how this might uh, work under certain other use cases that are privacy sensitive. But for the use cases we've been targeting, this sort of more open, singular shared metadata um, seems to work quite well since it promotes quite a bit of collaboration and so on. You can also use this same Python client to inspect the data within each task in case you want sort of, let's say to build a notebook for monitoring purposes as a business facing dashboard. Notebooks are quite heavily used at Netflix. So our Python client sort of creates this nice handoff between notebooks and Metaflow so that you can sort of interact with the Metaflow universe and still build these rich visual dashboards using notebooks. And quickly here, we have a run that you are accessing like for a given flow as its latest. And you can sort of, if run A was successful, you can print the value of X or you can just print sort of the standard error logs. And one other thing is we take care of reliably, you know, storing and, and propagating sort of logs wherever else it runs. So like whether it's a sub process, a different cloud machine, et cetera, we try to ensure that you have as much visibility into your tasks, even post facto, like in case a site fault happens. Uh, but yes, like a lot of logs most recently, we also did an overhaul of our log 
uh, collection process so that it's actually more managed just within Metaflow with some other uh, functionality that we have. But yes, you can imagine from this slide, the takeaway is that you have access to the logs of your task. You have visibility if it was successful into the artifacts that a given task produced. Therefore, you can nicely build, let's say once you got access to an accuracy, you can sort of build accuracy dashboard over the last 30 runs. Like that's a simple dashboard that you could easily build with the functionality demonstrated on the slide. We often get asked the question, is Metaflow yet another DAG scheduler? The answer is no. Running your workflows consistently on a schedule or based on data triggers seems pivotal to keeping your machine learning workflows robust in production. We think Metaflow could integrate with your favorite DAG schedulers so that the idea is we can abstract the orchestration of the DAG from the user specification or user intent. Metaflow would be responsible for translating that user intent to your favorite DAG scheduler DSL. In over the next couple of slides, I, I will show you what we've done with the scheduler integration sort of externally in open source. Um, but yeah, internally to Netflix, the user could just be specifying the same workflow as you've seen all along. And the idea is that just because you want to run it on a scheduler, which might require a different specification, a different DSL, and notice that this might be different from each of the schedulers, the user hopefully shouldn't worry about this translation. So it would be really nice if at all, just like they could run something on their local machine, they can do so very quickly on a production grade scheduler as well. As a step in that direction, we have provided a reference implementation by integrating with AWS step functions and written our, about our experience in this above link. Definitely check it out if you want to learn more about our philosophy about just scheduling and, and how Metaflow fits in in this picture. Like I mentioned just a little while ago, <clears throat> Metaflow takes care of translating your workflow DAG to AWS state language and configuring AWS step functions and AWS batch, which is sort of our compute layer, to work hand in hand with each other. I think a slightly subtle point here is that's why we have the job scheduler and the compute as two separate boxes, because the job scheduler could just be taking care of like scheduling when a specific task should run and how many should run in parallel and things like that. And then the compute, which would be AWS patch, actually takes care of running that. Specific to this integration, there were definitely a lot of nuances involved, which were skillfully handled by a teammate of mine uh, so that our users don't have to. Lastly, failures happen. We've seen that theme through this presentation and we just think it's better to accept that truth and equip you with the best toolkit to handle them. Therefore, we provide an easy way to rerun local or production from a specific step, step checkpoint so that you can quickly iterate on failures and deploy fixes quickly. So if you notice here on this slide, we have this feature called resume, which is almost like a run, but the only difference with resume is that if a given run has, has some portion of the run that is successful that we can reuse towards a future run, we just want to do that so that you can uh, imagine that you've done the data manipulation. It's quite an elaborate process. And then you're just iterating on training different kinds of models. This is an example where if you're prototyping, especially, you just want to keep reusing the data part and just focus on the on the training part again and again. Another example, as we saw the theme in this presentation, is if something failed in production, it would be really nice if you could just first reproduce that failure locally on your laptop, then you could make a fix and verify if the fix works. And then 
deploy that back to production. So that's what this uh, idea is meant to encapsulate. And that's why like from local runs, you can go to production scheduler by deploying it. And from production runs, you can come back to local using resume, especially in, in failures. But there are also use cases where we've seen our users use it for just reusing part of a successful run. So the way to do that would be you just say resume, you hopefully point it to the origin run that you want to, you want to run against. And again, all of this is being made possible because Metaflow versions everything, stores everything. Therefore, any given run that, you, that you've run, whether it's local or, um, or it's in production, as long as it's tracked by our metadata database, we know about it and therefore we can, we can get you dashboards about it or resume it so that you can rerun, et cetera. So with that, that's mostly what I have for all of you today. Hopefully that's a, that's a decent overview of Metaflow. Maybe what I can do is um, post this meetup. I could also add a few reference um, videos uh, that we've given. We've, we've presented Metaflow in a lot of other venues. As Dimitrios mentioned, we had a brilliant presentation at AWS reInvent. That's a little bit more elaborate um, than the one I have for you. This was more of a lightning talk flavor, mostly to create conversation, hopefully in Q&A. Um, so that's all I have nice. for all of you. Dude, awesome. It's really cool to see this. And yeah, we'll definitely be posting all of the, um, the relative links for everyone. If you're watching this in the future, check out the description below. And for now, uh, everyone that came to this, we'll put it out in the newsletter that goes out next week. So I've got a ton of questions. I see the chat is starting to blow up. Um, so let's see here. One question I know that is uh, super, I think, important for lots of people. You mentioned that you can now do it with R and Python. Are there any like prerequisites that you need? Because I notice you talk a lot about AWS. Can you also use Metaflow on GCP? What are, what are the prerequisites? What do you have to have to use Metaflow? I think to use Metaflow sort of bare bone, uh, you could do it just, it's a Python package. So you could just install it on your laptop as well. But like you're mentioning, I think if you do want to scale out to the cloud, then the integrations, which actually are modeled as plugins with, within the Metaflow code base. So in a lot of ways, we see this core that should be used with almost not any many dependencies, like we have some dependencies on Boto or something like that, but we constantly think about having the, our dependency footprint really, really low. Um, but I think um, in terms of integrations, we definitely have uh, various people we're working with sort of with a white glove support in case you're looking for integrations with GCP or Azure. And we do have some members of the community taking a stab using some of our, mm. taking a stab at that implementation using some of our reference implementations. But um, yeah. Awesome. So there's uh, two of the same questions. So I know it's on the top of many people's minds. They're wondering where does Metaflow store everything? And especially when it comes to the, um, the metadata, how, what do you use as a metadata store at Netflix? And and where does Metaflow store everything? Right. Um, yeah, no, thank you for the question. So there are two different pieces of storage. One, like I mentioned, is AWS S3 for all our data artifacts. So anything that you store as self.x, et cetera, uh, is in that um, data, uh, artif data warehouse. Uh, we also store some metadata information there, like just to know what are the objects you're storing? How many attempts did you have? Things like that. But coming to the metadata, we have a metadata database, uh, which is just like a, a SQL database. So I think open source, we use AWS RDS uh, for it. But it's a simple database which just keeps track of your runs and just tries to handle the ID logic so that you get sort of a unique ID for every run that's either globally increasing across all runs. I don't remember the exact thing in the, in the, uh, in the open source, but 
uh, but yes, I think, yeah. So metadata uses an AWS RDS instance, um, a simple one, and uh, other storage happens in S3 as much as possible. Nice. So um, there's a question that I know someone asked in Slack beforehand, and also I see Ron's asking it in the chat. If there's any tutorials available um, to use Metaflow in practice, and I believe there is on the GitHub page, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then somebody asked like a follow-up question to that because they played around with it in the beginning when it was released last year. And they were wondering, this um, Christian was wondering if it has been updated with examples like a, a Metaflow minced or something to that extent. Yeah, no, great question. Something that's definitely on the top of our mind. Uh, I also just noticed that one of my colleagues, Savin, is also on this call. So Savin, hello, uh, feel free to jump in if there are things you can also tell about Metaflow. But uh, going back to this tutorials question, yes, so I think you kind of answered it. We do have some tutorials. Uh, that was actually something that I spent some of my personal time on. If you just go to our Metaflow, open source, uh, just our CLI, like Metaflow Enter, like gives you access to some uh, tutorials where we've tried to mostly have this uh, sort of a journey that we can walk through our users with like a Netflix theme. So it's like introducing sort of features one by one. Uh, we are hoping to follow through uh, maybe early next year with these sort of these other kind of recipes or tutorials, which like maybe how do you do the specific MNIST um, with Metaflow? So things of that nature, or the other would be also just patterns. Like there are a lot of patterns that maybe internally even our users are using. Uh, and one thing that happened with tutorials, which is really nice externally, but doesn't exist internally is that it creates sort of some sample recipes that you know you you know oh the, if you had to do a hyperparameter search this is how it might look like so just having that I think is great uh, we are definitely thinking about it so definitely yeah ho hope to hear back from us soon um, I think this yeah. one's a short we'll quarter patiently with the holidays. Be waiting. Uh, no definitely something we've heard resounding feedback about and mm. uh, yeah we. We want to do that. I, I, yeah, I just think we haven't gotten to it yet. Yeah, it's in, in the pipe. So yeah. <laughs> really good one. Um, Horacio was asking about how things are deployed. Is it using Kubeflow? How, how do you deploy it? So right now, as you noticed, a lot of the reference implementations we've put out are with AWS. Um, and I assume the equivalent of Kubeflow might be I don't know if they're thinking of a production scheduler integration. So like I'm thinking it's probably AWS step functions that maps here. Although I know Kubeflow does more things uh, similar to SageMaker, I guess. Uh, but <clears throat> we have, again, some, uh, if you go to our Gitter community as well, um, there are a lot of users who are in the GCP world or the Azure world talking to us, trying to figure out how to, uh, and probably have their own GitHub branches as well um so yeah i think savin has something to say yes. about it yeah he um, just mentioned that there's a lot of uh, right. examples with metaflow yeah yeah so that i mean we definitely have some very active members in the community either taking a stab at some of these integrations that work just for themselves um and again something that others could also be inspired from john's got a great question in the chat um and these, these questions are awesome, everybody. Please continue to throw them at me. And if I, I miss one, just repost it so that you make sure and post it in all capitals so that I know I missed it. But John's asking, uh, like code generation and macros in, in 3GL pro programming, do you see Metaflow becoming a tool to develop and support AutoML? Mm, I, think it, I think this is a hard question. I don't know if I have all the background to answer it. Um, I'm not quite sure what it entails for Metaflow to become a tool to develop AutoML. Um, but I mean, one way I see it is yes, like if, like we want Metaflow to sort of be perhaps the lingua franca for data science. And then if let's say there is an 
integration that you can do with an auto ML service, like that could be something that Metaflow could encapsulate for you. So, so that the user intent specified is far simpler or more intuitive. And then Metaflow could do the heavy lifting of just integrating with that service. Mm. Uh, but I don't know if this is exactly what John has in mind as well when we think about developing uh, so auto ML. I know we're kind of running out of time and I have so many questions I would love to ask you, but I think I'm going to have to save the majority of them for when I talk with Savine. Savine, I know you're in here, so be prepared. We're, I'm coming for you. <laughs> you come on here. He's going to be on in December, I think. Uh, and we're going to have round two of this conversation. But I just want to know, as you put Metaflow out there and you open sourced it, what were some of the biggest learnings that you saw people doing that they weren't doing in Netflix? Like, I'm sure there was a lot of stuff that people started asking for. And in Netflix, you didn't even think about that. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'm smiling because I think that there are a ton of things that actually come to mind where it's asked in the community and just serendipitously, we've been talking at Netflix as well, maybe not to the same priority. So there are a ton of things where we'd just be talking about some idea, like let's say graph composition and just that day, there'd be four members in the community asking, hey, I'm trying to do this. Hey, have you thought about this, et cetera? So in some ways, I think the community has definitely told us a lot uh, or, or showcased a lot of these questions that have either kind of been on our mind or, or um, have been brewing somewhere in maybe one person's mind. Uh, but probably there are others. Like I think uh, just this tutorials, right? Like something that we even put out just during open source, but We've, learned, we've heard a lot of feedback about how, how, my, how we could sort of improve adoption or how the documentation could be even better. And those are some things we've heard from the community, mm -hmm. for example. Um, well, I know yeah. that when I asked in the MLOps community Slack about Metaflow and if people have played around with it, one of the resounding things that most people said was they really love the API and that the documentation is great. So you're doing, you're doing something right there. So congrats on that one. Now, I've got one more question from Gonzalo in the chat. He's asking, just to be clear on this, does Metaflow exist to help data scientists orchestrate everything from resources to pipelines from Python code while a cloud provider does the heavy lifting? Um. In some ways, yes. Uh, I do. I mean, I think something that I didn't bring out in the slide on the infrastructure stack was one other philosophy, like from the designer or Metaflow, like who was who's my manager, was that we felt for each of the pieces there is something out there that we could use and le leverage. So we didn't want to go and rebuild something that that already existed as a good solution. So Metaflow was about trying to reuse the best of each of those pieces while still providing sort of this comprehensive product-like experience that is still simpler to use from the user. So in some ways, yes, we want to use other things which could do the heavy lifting where possible. But also if you think about it, uh, there is this experience that we want to give for our users that is seamless between prototyping to production. And what that means is we might have to have a simple scheduler during prototyping because there's probably like we have to simulate something in our local experience, right? So there are things we have built and we do take performance quite seriously off the core. So there are some things we're doing, uh, but yes, in we want to integrate with other things um, as much as possible um, while not necessarily exposing the same uh, complexity to our user. Oh, uh, you just saw. <laughs> What Ron put in the chat, didn't you? <laughs> I yeah, saw your I, I saw you smile when you <laughs> Ron, great question because I was gonna get into the stranger things. I was gonna ask if they're shooting season four yet, but uh Ron was asking when the next season of The Last Kingdom comes out. I imagine you're not privy to this kind of information, or even if you are, you don't want to talk about that in the MLOps meetup. Um let's let me just ask you this. I I see that um so Horacio is asking, what do you version? You kind of mentioned that in the talk, you version everything. You make sure right. to try and 
and version everything that you can. So reproducibility is huge for Metaflow. Yeah. And I imagine that you get a lot of companies that are highly regulated that really appreciate that. You've probably got um, banks and fintech that thank you very much for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I think uh, they, with some of the things that are extremely sensitive about data, I do think they want a more privacy sensitive story. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's something, again, for us to think about. Um, but for all, everything we version, definitely for something that's either cloud first or just wants to promote this hugely collaborative environment across. Um, I noticed like for mid, small to mid-sized startups that might not want to have a machine learning infrastructure team of their own, but have data scientists who wish to be more productive. I think something like Metaflow would help them the most. Mm. At least that's what I think is our target audience of sort, maybe. Um, so how does the... Like, how does a data scientist go and get this? Is it as simple as a pip install or is yeah. there some legwork that you need to do? What hopefully, on the spectrum of like simplicity? What are hopefully the, not. I think I think our, our get started should be as simple as pip install Metaflow on your laptop. I think it should work. Uh, we have tried to, again, hearing feedback from the community, like we've also written elaborate documentation for setting up your AWS cloud ecosystem, for example, if you had if it had to tie well with Metaflow, uh, for example. So we've tried to do that as well. But if you just wanted to go ahead and give Metaflow a try, even just spin up a simple flow and run it locally on your laptop, I think a pip install Metaflow and then just using the tutorials that ship with Metaflow should be the easiest way to get there. Nice. So I'm going to come at you with one last question. I know we got <laughs> two minutes left um, and feel free to go over if you need to, but I'm wondering, you said you're, as you go down that stack that you mentioned earlier, you get more and more opinionated. You have some opinions about certain things. Can you go into what those opinions are and why you felt strongly about that? So let's go with the simplest one. So like at the bottommost layer is S3, right? And in that S3, you can see that an opinion is let's version everything. Let's store everything. And it is a strong opinion. We're not trying to offer choice to our users with some sort of an opening saying, maybe store this or put some sort of, uh, you know, like a directive saying, don't store this. That's an example of an opinion. And we think, and we've obviously done infrastructure work to, to, to make that happen. It, the content addressability nature of it is, is an example of something we had to do or, uh, yeah, so that's an example. Um, I, I mean, if you think at slightly higher levels as well, like a compute layer or, or um, scheduler orchestration, we think quite a lot about what knob to expose to the user uh, and we want to try and, and we also want to take backward compatibility seriously. So like if we export some option, we don't want to like very quickly roll it back. So each and every option that's out there, like even a thing like resources, what resources do we want to ask them? What should we expose? Uh, what are kind of the uh, openings that might, that might incur with it? And in all of this, Netflix definitely has like a high freedom and responsibility culture like than most other places I've seen. So definitely people want a lot of freedom. And that's why, um, I, that's why we, we uh, within Netflix at least, there's quite a lot of times where we're providing a, a hook to do something. And, but every time we provide something like that, we want to sort of understand the consequences or the responsibility part of it. So, um, yeah, I, I think at the lowest layer, I see it at the higher levels, hopefully it does make sense to you where the knobs we are exposing to the user, which again map to that integration, isn't like the whole spec, so to say. Mm. So cool. Mm. I really appreciate you coming and talking to us. I see there is another question in the chat, but we're going to finish it here. If someone wants to continue the conversation with you, what's the best way to get involved, get and reach out to you. Yeah, so I left that on the slide. I think help at metaflow.org is, is an alias that should work. We also have a very active Gitter community. I'll try and leave a link to that on my slide post nice. this presentation. Just feel free to jump into the Gitter community. If, if you really want 
if you think Metaflow is something you'd use at your company or something, definitely write to us. We'll try to find the best engagement model for you. And I also left my personal email in case somebody wants to just ask me a question. Okay. Yeah, nice. Well, um, hopefully you, we can also convince you to come and join our MLOps Slack and you can talk to people there. I've left a link to the MLOps Slack in the chat in case there is anybody here that is not in it already. And we're going to have round two for this. So if you enjoyed this, come back for round two in December with Sabine. All of you will be informed in the newsletter. And again, thank you, Ravi. This was awesome, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It was great being here. <laughs> See you all later. <laughs>